Well, hello. Welcome back to me, you, and Jeju. We have Tommy live this time. Tommy Tran, our guest that has been on our show. This is your third time. Yeah. No third kidding. Time. You're a repeat. Wow, I didn't even know. I Gosh. But this is the first time that he's going to be on the show as a like a guest. Yes, that's as right. An interview. You did great. Because okay. every time he's been on, he's been on to discuss, you know, whatever the right. topics of the day. Right, right, right. So, and we're on location here at As Asalam. As Asalam, As mm -hmm. which is is it still the only Yemeni's restaurant? No, or is there well, more now? it's I would say it's Arabic. And there's two on the island. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. But this is, you know, my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much live here. Uh -huh. yeah. And it's well. interesting. I was doing a little bit of research about the restaurants since we're going to come here. And, like, I wrote about it twice. And oh, really? Yeah, I've written about it for, <laughs> you know, whatever. And then uh, U UN uh, Human Rights Council, mm. they also did a piece on it, right? Like, to yeah. talk about the refugee situation here. But also, like, it's a, it's a positive story when it comes to it's embracing amazing. of uh, yeah it's, it's fantastic yeah. Right. it's a love story it's a good good people story it's everything story yeah, yeah. well people don't can you explain the love story because people don't know oh that. sure do you know the love story right a little bit a little, little bit that. so uh, the owner um she is um she got Sorry, wow, I need to concentrate. <laughs> so I'm like, let me tell you about this. Uh, the owner is a good friend of mine, and she, when the Yemeni refugees first came here, she had a studio, um, and she just let everybody crash at her studio. Yeah. Um, it was, I think at one point there was 20 people sleeping there, you know, just on the floor. Yeah. They'd pack everything up and put it away. But what ended up happening is they started doing group dinners. Right. And they anyone, even if you weren't sleeping there, everyone could come and be together and have a dinner. And so the guys would cook, and anyone, anyone was invited, and we, there would be these group dinners. So one of the guys that there was there, she fell in love with, and now he is the chef. Yeah, it's and a great story. Yeah, it's a great story. It was a great wedding. It's a great, yeah, it was mm. amazing, yeah. Yeah, and so we're, first of all, thank you so much for having us here and letting yes. us yeah, do the yeah, podcast yeah. here. Yeah. And it's so good to see you, Tommy. Yeah. Thank you. Tommy flew in from California <clears throat> just for the interview, right? <laughs> just for the interview, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and again, so people know, he's a lecturer at the University of California, Merced. Merced. You did, that, you did that last time, too, do you remember? I do every single time. He did that last time, Merced. And you're a PhD in Asian languages and cultures, is That's that correct? Right. Perfect. So but before we get to our interview, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, I saw this fascinating article today, and I wanted to pose a question to you first before we get into it. Okay. Is Jeju tourism a victim of its own success? I think definitely it is. Uh huh. Why? Well, numerically, Jeju's, um, Jeju's tourism is uh, far beyond even that of the entire state of Hawaii. We're talking, no way. We're talking about all of the islands of Hawaii, not just just Oahu where everyone ends up. In. So Jeju, in terms of land area and size, Jeju is about the same as Oahu. But we're, if we're including the entire state of Hawaii, Jeju getting much more tourism than the entire Hawaiian island chains. That's pretty much insane in terms That's of volume. That's insane. Yeah. It's a really good idea to I, that, talk about Hawaii yes. compared to Jeju for yes. so many reasons now. Yeah. Not just, yeah, not like, just superficial <laughs> reasons, right? But mm -hmm. for legitimate reasons. Yeah, we're like, talking mm -hmm. about 15 to 16 million tourists a year for That's, Jeju yeah. compared to Hawaii's 8 to 9 million. Uh -huh. Well, and Hawaii has long, long uh, ago asked people to stop coming do yes. you do you know is that are you about to bring that no, up I like actually, long ago yeah. said really please stop coming to our state so i, so I was speaking to some uh, like experts lecturers in tourism like university professors in tourism i asked them like so what can we do like what do you see are there any problems with jeju tourism or anything like that and they said that they need to come up with a cap they need to cap how many because there's yes. even in tourism industry there's an issue of trying to balance uh like local enjoyment like the locals enjoyment of the life and also this is good jeju's enjoyment right. of uh, uh, tourist tourism uh, yeah enjoyment here and so the article i was talking about we talk a lot about cars right and rental cars on jeju the price of them has skyrocketed oh right it you can't even find one yeah. let alone rent one if you could find one so, did you find one yeah are you renting Oh, I don't, I don't ever dare drive a car. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Tommy, 
calling it out like it is. So the cost right now to rent like a mid-sized car, mm-hmm. this comes from Choson uh, Biz, which is okay. a good article, yeah. good newspaper. They said that um, it's about 1.3 million won for a week to wow. rent a what? car, uh, uh, like a regular, it's a... XM3, so it's like not, not a special even, car or anything that's like, like that. That's like buying a car. That's like buying a car. Right. It's right. more expensive than so, my car that I bought, <laughs> my piece of shit car that I have. Part of the reason for that is that, you know, the former governor, Governor Wan, he instituted a policy back in 2018 to try to reduce cars on the road. Rental cars mm-hmm. on Jeju. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now, instead of, there was 3,303, 30,303 rental cars in Jeju. Now it's down to 29,800. That's a massive difference. Well, it's 500 car difference. But oh, I thought it's 5,000. Sorry. My way. <laughs> All right, Alexis. But that has caused the price to partially one of the reasons why it's gone up. Also, the demand. Yeah, the demand. But what people are doing instead is they're shipping their cars to Jeju. It's cheaper. I'm sorry, what? People are paying 600,000 won to ship their like cars. Like on a ferry? On a ferry. And then they just drive, they their, drive own? their own car. Is that here. round trip? Yes. Part of me thinks that's genius. Yeah. That's very smart. The other hand is like, that's crazy. Right. I. But that's crazy. The purpose of the whole policy was to pre- prevent congestion yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it's kind of backfired, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, to get anywhere on Jeju now is so hard. Mm. It takes so long to do anything on Jeju. Oh, well, I've that. you know, like <laughs> even when I first moved here 10 years ago, yeah. most local residents didn't have cars. Yeah. You know, it just wasn't. All my friends didn't have cars. Yeah. My friends' parents didn't yeah. have cars. I mean, now everybody has a car. But yeah. before, taxis, buses, that was yeah. it, you but know? Buses yeah. suck on Jeju. Yeah. Yeah. The transportation's yeah. not very good. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, I lived in Shinjeju in, in 2010, and well, it took well. only 15 minutes by bus to get to Gujeju. But yeah. now it's, no. it's 45 minutes to an hour. Right. Because and, of congestion. Yep. And so this goes back to the question about okay. <laughs> is it. Uh, is, is Jeju becoming a victim of uh, yeah. a tourism of its own success because it's costing so much to come here on a trip nowadays? Yes. Yeah. Why not just go to Thailand where it might be cheaper? Yeah, exactly. Right? So, um, and so I'm, this is something that I think Jeju really needs to consider about how it needs, how it's going to prioritize its tourism. Is it going to get like expensive tourism, like high class? Tourism, boutique tourism, or is it go- because you can't do any you more? Can't do anymore. Right, right. No one's not gonna. Right. No one's gonna pay ten thousand dollars for a trip to Jeju for Mini Mini Land, right? It's right. not that special, right? So yeah. What like what do you foresee? What are you our thoughts about Jeju tourism being a victim of its own success? I think the key problem is that that when they went with budget tourism, they kept running with it and they didn't mm-hmm. know when to stop. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um. So certainly in the beginning when we had the budget carriers, um, it, it was it was a great thing at first. But then suddenly we have all these other budget carriers appearing at the same time. Yep. We had Jin Air, we had T Way, we had E Star. All these suddenly bam, appearing. Bam, bam. Yep. Bam. We and more whole, coming. Yeah, we basically have the entire population of Seoul coming to judge. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, uh-huh. um, so. In the beginning, it was probably a good thing for Jeju, but now, like, when is it going to stop? That's the, that's When's the main enough issue. enough? Mm-hmm. And, um, and another problem is that even with the planning itself, it seems like there's no clear idea of what exactly the cap is, even though there is an awareness that Jeju really cannot handle any of this. Mm-hmm. Um, the, there is an awareness of it. People there in government? Is. Yeah. In, in government documentation, there, there are long term plans. There is an awareness that they can't keep doing this forever. Mm. Do you think the government's not willing to, to make a stand because they don't want people to turn against them? Do you I think, think that's, that's part of it? That's a major problem, okay. too. Because, uh, they have another, to be careful. Yeah, another problem with, um, with politics in general is that many of these governors and, and mayors, they, they want to get something out of their term. Mm-hmm. They're only in their term for X amount of years, mm-hmm. so they have to make some kind of impact. Mm-hmm. So, it, so kind of, so ironically, um, liberal democracy accidentally feeds into this this need to make something. Yes. And we've seen this with Governor One as well. You're right, right. And so you think a good policy plan would be like to come up, I want to be governor of Jeju, you should vote for me because I will do nothing. <laughs> right. <laughs> I do, it does seem that way, though, yeah. like, or, or just... The opposite, which is allowing too much growth on the islands. Right. You know, I think Governor Juan did not do a good... Well, he enabled so much growth on this yes. island that really had a negative impact. I mean, I think that's what he will be remembered for, was just how massively the growth on the island... The, sorry, the development on the island grew under his term. Right. Yeah. So, 
based on some of the documents that I've looked at and stuff, part of the development is, like the, the driving force behind it is to grow the economy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Is there, is that what you're seeing too? Is that the main driving force for the development is just simply to keep the economy here growing? Yeah, the, um, another problem with the policy itself is the assumption that everything in Korea is gonna grow forever, which is certainly not, uh -huh. because the population is shrinking. The economy is the smallest, indeed set right? to shrink the next few years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, with the growth first policy and the reality that the country is not growing, there's this um, endless drive to just keep on building and hope they'll come. Right. Build it. Build it, it and they will come. come. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. I just read an article. Didn't, uh, maybe, I, I wish, don't quote me here, but I think I just read that in Seoul. Yeah. It was the lowest population growth uh, since... When was the last decline? 80s? Was that the 80s? Yeah, I think so. I'm horrible with dates. If you know me, you know I'm horrible. Date. But I just read the article that it's uh, the lowest since that last decline. So it's a, it's a big yeah, deal. Yeah, it's a big and the deal. government certainly is pushing for people to have babies. They're like, take some money. Yeah. Have a baby, have some money. Have two yeah. babies, have some more money. Oh, yeah. It's, it's yeah. yeah. Especially in a country that's like, the, the ranks the lowest among the OECD nations mm -hmm. for, for fertility and, mm -hmm. and children. And they're, they don't seem very gung-ho about immigration. No. So, no. That's not going to change any time soon. <laughs> uh, it's such a... Yeah, anyway, yeah, that's, a whole, that's a whole topic, harder, right? Mm. Sorry? If anything has gotten harder to get into Korea. I think yeah. so. I think so. Yeah, so do you have any, like, what would you like to see to happen with the tourism here? Because you can't stop it. You can't, you can't just end it now. Yeah. Well, certainly there, there needs to be actual discussions on what Jeju's capacity mm. is. Mm -hmm. and flights in and out, maybe? Yeah, like flights. And also, and also think about what kind of tourism they actually want. That's what you were that, saying, Yeah, right? that's another problem. That they're, like, they're, They have an idea of what Jeju is going to be, but, but Jeju cannot be everything all at once, which is the main problem in these, these policies mm -hmm. to begin with. Mm -hmm. right, yeah. Jeju has to be mm -hmm. something, not everything. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. You know, I always thought, I just had the expat festival yesterday, but I yeah. always went, the first time I moved here, and during the spring and summer months, there would be a, a festival every weekend on Jeju yeah. in every different part. And it always amazed me because, like you're saying, you can't be everything. I, I just thought, why instead of just, like, having a festival, boom, 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 why wouldn't you, like, pull your resources and have a couple really good festivals, the fire right. festival, um, an, uh, you know, another, another sort of festival, instead of just, like, every little village has its own... <laughs> Right. It, it, that could know. be a cultural thing, though, right? Like, yeah. Jimun has its I own thing, I, and that's a big thing for Jimun. The government gives the money for the yeah. festivals, though. That's true. So it was sort of these things, that, in my opinion, people were like, well, let's get money, and let's have this festival. Jimun, that's different. Mm -hmm. But when you're having a festival in every, and it's not based around anything, I think yeah. it was, yeah. I'll take the money, we'll hold a festival. Yeah. That actually is was a policy from the late 1990s, and part of the reason was because of decentralization of the government in the late 1990s, that it's really every locality for itself and trying to attract as mm -hmm. much attention as possible. Uh -huh. So it doesn't matter what, what uh, the outcome is. As long right. as they get attention, that's all they need. Right, right. But then in the end result, in my opinion, is nobody's getting attention yeah. or the good enough attention. Like, yeah. You know, like it, it's a little too much. That's a cool watch. I was just distracted. Yeah. Sorry, audience. Yeah. I'm just like distracted by your very fancy watch. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's there's um there's a professor at UT Austin who also looks into this phenomenon, um, Dr. Yu Jung Oh. She also is a native of Jeju, and she's actually oh. working on a project on um, the phenomenon of um of Wolcheng and how that place basically <sighs> turned from a sleepy little Henya village yes. into the next big thing. Mm. It's well. We when I first moved here, we called the foreigners. Called nobody would go to that beach. Right. Nobody. There was one cafe and there was one little tiny restaurant. Do you remember? Yeah. And all foreigners loved it, but it was hard to get to. You That's know, the cactus place, knew. right? Where yeah. all the cactuses yeah. are. Well, yeah. now we called it. Then we started calling it the cafe beach. Now we call it Insta Beach uh -huh. because right. everyone just goes to take photos there. But I have that is. I will sit at one of the cafes on the roof and look down and just watch everyone getting car accidents below. It's, it's <laughs> ridiculous. Well, not not to not to pump my own tires. I recently did a. Did you a just say pump my own tires? Is that a phrase in a? Canada? Yeah. Oh, great. What? Isn't there a phrase everywhere? Pump no, my own tires? I've heard that, I no, heard that before. <laughs> Fill my own gas? To, eat to my, my own food? To my horn. To my own horn. <laughs> no, I, anyways, <laughs> I, I, did a, a, I was recorded for, uh, to talk about Sasam for a recent travel show. Mm -hmm. And we went to Wujong. 
and the, like that was a place that they definitely wanted to have on camera and the, I don't know that much about like my, my expertise is very small I and mean, they're like so tell us about Wuljong and I'm just like um, <laughs> it used to be like this now it's yeah. like this <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Now it's a miniaturized version of Waikiki, basically. Yeah. Really, it's, it's, it's madness. And there's not enough parking. Yeah. Uh, you can't, there's nothing to, to, to have that many cafes. And they're stacked on top of each other. So mm. one's here and then another one's here. Oh, yeah. There's not enough parking. There's no, there was no development planning so for that town. So well, why, why, what happened there? What did she look at? That's interesting. I? It, it, that's, that's something I've been trying to figure out myself. And once this book out comes out by uh, Dr. O, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll find, find out. Yeah. Uh. Is she, was she, not to bring up somebody else, but is she, that was essential, her her study was just Wuljung, or? Um, her, like, her overall um, research is on the phenomenon of, of um, place making and place selling in, okay. in Korea in general. Okay. But then okay. she decided to return to her, her, home, um, her home island and look at the case study of Wuljung. Mm. But she, because that also boggled her mind. If, why Wuljung? Why, Wuljung? Yeah. why right. this place in the middle of nowhere back then yeah. suddenly become the big thing? Yeah, because it really is in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, it's it's right. a, such a far point out, yeah. you know, like to get to, yeah. So let's, uh, we've talked a bit about the tourism side, mm-hmm. like and the, for the tourists and that kind of stuff. Let's talk a little bit about the effects on Jeju. What are, and the Jeju locals, what are some of the effects of this uh, Tourism is a victim of its own success. How is that impacting the local Jeju people? Uh, certainly, Jeju is far more expensive than it used to be when I first came in way back in 2007. Mm. So when I came in 2007, it was probably one of the most affordable places I'd been in Korea because not a lot of people wanted to come here. Right. But then flash forward only three years later, when I came back in 2010, it was already one of the more expensive parts mm-hmm. of Korea. Then mm-hmm. flash forward again, when I started doing my dissertation research, it was the most expensive part of Korea. It is the most expensive part. Oh, yeah. There was a recent... I, I recently tweeted about it, so, you know, go follow us on me and JJ Twitter, um, <laughs> about um, how foreign ownership, I don't want to say foreigners, but oh, non-Korean gosh, ownership has gone up a lot, like 25%, like of all the par- all the uh, the home buying on Jeju, 25% of it, I believe, yeah. was by non-Koreans. And also land transfers were like 30% in the last four months or three months of the year, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And so that's got to have, and that's got people concerned, right? Well, yeah. And they should be, <laughs> yeah. I think it's one of those, I've, I've been... I don't know if I'm lucky enough, but I've been lucky enough to live in Hawaii in various, like, to go to various, but pre-tourism. Uh, <clears throat> and then and then the unlucky part is you could see, and I see it on Jeju so plainly, what tourism does to an area and how it can break it down, and it's not sustainable. Mm-hmm. And then when your town is focused on tourism, it will not last forever. Yeah. And then what are you going to do? What are we going to do with all these cafes, all these empty apartment buildings, all yeah. these hotels? What are we going to do with these right. places, you know? Has, you know, J- J- has this already happened to Jeju? Because I remember coming here and seeing, like, there's there's a ton of old abandoned, abandoned hotels that never got finished. And in Jungmin, there used to be these two mm. balls. The like the, I don't know how to explain it. They look like testicles. Yeah. But there were these two spheres yeah. of metal that yeah. I had no idea what they were ever going to become and they were only within the last year or so been removed but they were there forever yeah. well, do you remember the hotel in Jungmoon outside of Jungmoon we used to sneak into it mm. and it, we would just not do any damage of corporate yeah. it was so fascinating it was beautiful be- yeah. one of the most gorgeous I have traveled all over the world it was one of the most gorgeous patios with a yeah. pool and outside bar right. these big wood doors heavy wood doors yeah. that were around huh. and we would just go I wish I had pictures of it but back then who had cameras we didn't have a camera we didn't have cell phones and stuff like it wasn't the same right. and it sat empty and we would just go and we would just hang out we would sit on the cliff we would drink a beer and then we they had a guard they had to pay a guard yeah. to, do you remember that so we would this sounds horrible but we would, we would sneak in the back <laughs> in the back way and it just sat there for years. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's I think it's reopened. But is are oh, no way. I, I I don't go. I don't leave my house. I'm just I think so. But like there was another building that is now the Olay Trail Office Building in Sogipo, right. and that was a beautiful empty building that just sat there rotting forever. But are these is this like are these empty buildings uh, a symptom of old like success like? Victims of its own success. Oh, certainly. Uh, during during uh, the Japanese tourism bubble, the back in back in um, back in the seventies, up until in, up until the nineties. So, um, 
So once, the, once Japan's economy crashed in the 90s, basically all of that tourism development was, was just for nothing. Uh -huh. So you had these large numbers of abandoned hotels, and you had these abandoned brothels in Shinjaju. And I remember when I came in 2000, 2007, uh, like the shells of these abandoned brothels were still all around in Shinjaju, and really? everyone kind of knew that they were there, but they just wouldn't talk about it. Huh, interesting. I, I'll be honest with you, I didn't know Japanese tourism was a thing here. Oh, it was, it was very big. In the, that makes in the, sense. Yeah. yeah, certainly in the 60s and the 70s, it, the, the government of Japan itself was actually involved in Jeju tourism. So, what do you mean involved in? Oh, if, as part of, um, part of the, their uh, discussions on normalizing relations between South mm, Korea and mm, Japan, mm. Um, part of the stipulation was to open parts of Korea for Japanese tourism. So um, Japan was having a problem that they were overworking their own office workers and they were starting to get a little disgruntled. <laughs> so, um, so basically the Japanese government, uh, what they did was to work with corporations in Japan to have tourism packages to Korea. As soon as Korea reopened to Japan, uh, Japrio is kind of like this outlet for these disgruntled office workers. And a good chunk of it was actually sex tourism. I was just, and, yeah, um, I was just and, about to say. Yeah, and one of the <clears throat> points for discussion was to make Jeju one of the prime locations for sex tourism in Japan from Japanese uh, tourists. Wait, like like officially? Um, like it's kind of it was spoken in the discussions. It's not technically official, but it's basically what they discussed in, as part of uh, the development aid. Yeah, considering the, the uh, prostitution's a uh, sex work in general is just illegal here. Yeah. But then also like the. The apologies for the sex, you know, for the oh, sex slaves. Know, like the sex oh, slaves wow, stuff. I didn't so, even think like, that's that. wild to me yeah. that you know, and then here Korea de keeps demanding. I I know of apologies. stories of people on Jeju who were like second wives for Japanese men, and that they would like come back and forth, and they had like two families essentially. They were put up in nice apartments in Jeju. Okay. Well, because they could afford it, That's and JJ really was still. Yeah. Dwarf. So if you ever have a chance to look at um, these collections of of um, building records in, uh, I think it's, I don't know if it's in, in uh, the um, the provincial off or provincial library, mm -hmm. but there is a collection of books that were approved by by the Jeju government for construction, and they actually show these these photographs, these these really elaborate buildings that are of a mixed modern and Korean style. Mm -hmm. But these buildings were actually these brothels that were catering to Japanese tourism during the 60s and 70s. That's so wild to me. Yeah, it was That's completely an open secret. Everyone knew about it, right. even though it technically was not legal. Right. Well, th there's still brothels behind City Hall, yes, right? Yeah. You know, like yeah, and there's yeah, so that's yeah. fascinating because that's you know because Jeju, to my knowledge, is probably the only one of the only places, maybe the only place that didn't have a comfort women's station in Korea. Even though some scholars have tried to argue that there was at least one here, but the argument may not be on solid ground because yeah. it's. It's hard. It's hard to go from. Yeah, it's all just hearsay. Yeah, mm -hmm. like you, you hear rumors every now and then that that there was a comfort station at Alto, right, right, um, right by Dejang. But, all right. But again, that's only hearsay. You don't know. If that's really true. Yeah, I there was a I went I covered it. There was a conference that somebody held to say like we found a comfort woman station on Jeju, but it was like one person's recollections or, yeah. of these uh, like suicide. Uh, what are they called? Kamas, ka, kamakazi boat U-boat drivers that were like in Gosan, where they were stationed, or where the yeah. So like, but that's it. Like, there's no any real proof other than one person saying, "I that think this is what it was." Right. But like, let's go to Jeju Dialect Corner, and we'll come back and we'll talk to Tommy more about. Pick his brain. This about is all awesome. Good yeah. Stuff. yeah. This is yeah, fascinating. Yeah. And now we're back for yet another Jeju learning lesson. I decided I like the Jeju LL. You like that? Yeah, the alliteration. <laughs> Welcome back to our amazing teacher, the amazing Juju. I said that two times because uh -huh. she's that good. Hi. Hey, hi, good hi. to see you again. Thank so you for being here. So what do you have for us this week, Juju? Oh, you know what? I was streaming the other day and I, um, you're always swimming, by the way. Yeah, I was gonna say the other day. Yeah, the, we'll other, day. Yeah. the other day. <laughs> she, can't, she can't get out of the water. She's like damn mermaid at this point. But okay, so she, yeah. you're swimming, you're swimming. Yeah. And I, you know, like, uh, remembered one of my best, uh, my favorite, uh, Jeju dialect. Uh, 
Ooh. And uh, it sounds really fun. It's fun mm -hmm. to say, fun okay. to know. So I thought, you know, like, um, why not, you know, teaching you guys that word this way. Exactly. So it's, you know, like imagine you are swimming, you know, swimming in the water and okay. you, you can't, yeah, you can't uh, touch the ground, right? Oh. So the water is deeper than your height, right? Okay. Uh -huh. So we call that that situation or you know that uh mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> wait do it again omulak 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 okay yeah, that so is very for example, fun to say by the way yeah. umulak, umulak, umulak. yes <laughs> like, for example oh be careful it's omulak you know uh. yeah it's deep the water is deep so like um two days ago i was swimming with my friends and um i thought it was omulak to me Mm -hmm. and but i i tiptoed a little bit and then i could touch the ground and mm -hmm. my head my <laughs> mouth was like you know a little bit up above mm -hmm. the above. Uh, water yeah and i said i i said um oh it's i thought it was omelak but it's not omelak to me and mm -hmm. a friend of mine is shorter than me and she said, oh, it's omelak to me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it was, uh, it was fun. Yeah, that's good. That's you know what it makes? It kind of makes me giggle a little bit because, you know, we're going to be upon beach season soon mm -hmm. and the fun police, a.k.a. the lifeguards, <laughs> will not let you get yes. omelak mm -hmm. at the beach come beach season. So yeah. really? Oh yeah. my God, no, Daryl, no. It's really it's annoying. Emotion, yeah, it's really annoying. So that's why all the Jeju people everybody has their secret places to go that the mm -hmm. uh, fun police don't bother exactly. them when they get omalak mm -hmm. well, I think that's I all those fun. that's all those lifeguards do is that they people do. smoke they on the tell, beach yeah they do all the stuff that the, nope. the signs say no but no nope. yeah. is, is the one thing that they do enforce they a hundred percent oh man they have chased me in a boat not chased me because i wasn't going anywhere <laughs> i was just <laughs> <laughs> I was just swimming around. Jeez. They sent a boat around. Oh, in your hood, um, in your hood, Juju, and give me. Yeah, uh, you know I know that. Little, I know that so, yeah, you know. So I was <laughs> out swimming, hiding, kind of mm -hmm. under the, you know, the past that rocky. Yeah, and they uh. sent a boat up and around to come yell mm -hmm. at me. And so <laughs> then I, okay, wait, 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 wait. Then I stood up, and uh -huh. the water was only waist deep, and I was like, uh -huh. "What, dude? What <laughs> do you want from me?" And I just was like, "I can't even see you. I can't see you." <laughs> Here's the thing. Um, so like during summer there's uh -huh. like lifeguards right so mm. you are not supposed to swim in the water where's no lifeguards oh. so that's why they came to that mm. little that little of the, yeah beach yeah. Oh. from that main beach you know oh. you are supposed to be in that main beach only in that area yeah and also oh, here, here's the tip so you know like i want to swim anywhere i want you right? want to swim oh yeah all I, the time. I don't yeah i don't want to be bothered by the <laughs> mm -hmm. uh lifeguards so i mm -hmm. usually go to uh go swimming really early in the morning before yeah, <laughs> yeah before lifeguards. they get yeah. out there yes. yes yes i think so. any now these days any long-term resident like i said we all have our little places you know like mm -hmm. not necessarily beaches anymore mm -hmm. i think most mm -hmm. of my friends now are all about crawling over the rocks and going out you know as long as yeah. we're not in henyo property you know mm. it's it's okay yeah mm -hmm. that reminds me i want to ask a umalak so this would be mm -hmm. a, actually a really common word among the henyo wouldn't it oh i don't know i don't do know any <laughs> henyo though i don't know any henyo yeah yeah, yeah. but everything they do is like, yeah you you yeah. go yeah, hunt I'll around ask. in sagipo yeah no i mean imagine it would be because it's a thing like yeah. they have to go on teams they they, they have Yes. And they have like different rules and they, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's There's actually quite a strict thing. So I imagine that would be a word that would be quite you. So also the other thing, umulok, what is the, mm -hmm. can you like break it down for me? Because omulok is the mul meaning water. Water. Right? I don't or know. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I think it's just one word. It doesn't mean like. O doesn't represent anything, you know. Sure. Just oh, like right. omulak means, I think. Okay. I think it's it's like uh, I don't know the 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 words for that. Like for example, the it describes 
um, the where you are. No, the situation yeah. or you know, like oh. the your body is like oh my luck. Okay, it's like you know what I mean. Like a sound. Yeah. Is it to describe a sound of um, you going underneath the water? You know what? Let me look it up. Oh, <laughs> I, have a little, yeah. I love our expert teacher. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, while she's looking it up, I just think like, it's fun to say she called it. I'm a look. I'm a look. Yeah. Mm, Im imitative word. Okay. Because oh, Koreans have yeah. a lot of these, like, uh, yes. I mean, I noticed it, especially with my daughter, with all the nursery rhymes and stuff that she has. There's a lot of like, it's it's like words that like are like sounds or yeah. Yeah. like onomatopoeia yeah. or yeah. um just that singer the singer that we, lunk, we lunk. yeah you know things like that yeah yeah so i think it's like word to describe the the um the going the shape or the 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 move you know yeah yeah the mm -hmm. going like, down yes. yeah omlak again uh -huh. omlak. i don't know I don't know. <laughs> that, that's that's my guess. I Listen, Juju, sure. you can't yeah. know everything, so we <laughs> just appreciate you uh, teaching that fun word. I am oh, so I'm I'm, I'm definitely here for that word. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna start gonna... yelling at the lifeguards. I'm not. I'm a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you'll if they keep if, if they still come after you, then you'll mm -hmm. know if they're from the mainland. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. 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 imported oh, that's lifeguards. That's yeah. Well, thank you. Ju Perfect. That was great. Thank you for that another... was so good. Thank you so much, Juju. Yes. Perfect oh, for right summertime. So, Tommy, do you know much Jeju Saturi? Do I know much Jeju Saturi? Speaking it, not really. Yeah. <laughs> like, understanding it, kind of. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes, especially because I had to interview a lot of older people. They they would throw throw in Jeju Saturi out of left field, and and there would be times I'd puzzle over what they were saying, and then after a while, I kind of got used to it. Mm -hmm. Like I wouldn't say I speak it, but I can kind of understand what mm -hmm. they're saying. Right. I, 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 we don't have any Saturi in Canada. I, I mean, not really. I guess maybe like in the far side, but I'm really interested in it because like, Jumun has its own Saturi for something. And I just found this out the other day. I was talking to my aunt and my uncles and stuff about this. And they're like, well, in Jumun, it's this. And it's something else and somewhere else. And it just floors me. Yeah. yeah. Well, when, when I went um, researching with Joey, you all know Joey, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Friend of the show. Yep. Yeah. So we, we found five different names in five different villages for the same thing. So um, so, so this plant called the Hanatari. It's also called a dulegi, it's called a hanalegi, it's called a chalegi. There's many different names for it. <laughs> right. And That's every cool. village has its own name. It, yeah. was, it was just so mind-boggling. Yeah. Before we get to our interview, I'm curious if you know, what is the state of Jeju Satori right now? Not to put you on the spot, like is it as, you know, dire? Sorry, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jinx, you owe me a beer. Uh, at least, um, yeah, at least uh, from linguistic perspectives, um, and of course, uh, Moral Saltzman uh, can tell you more mm -hmm. about this. It certainly is critically endangered because there's there's just not many people passing it on to the next generation, mm -hmm. and um, the younger generations that do pick up parts of it, it's uh, it's very much mixed with the Seoul dialect. So um, so a lot of people do well. Obviously, dialects do change, but um, but there's such a heavy influence influence of the Seoul dialect that they do start to adopt um, the intonations that are more common in the Seoul dialect. Yeah, and the uh, definitely the more. Non Korea, uh, not non Koreans, non Jeju people who move to the island from yeah, the mainland, that's going to di dilute it even more yeah, exactly. and more, right? So, and, and that's the plan. 1.5 million people is the, the government's goal, I think, right. for Jeju. So, and where they get, they're not going to come all from us because no. Jeju people aren't having babies like everybody else not having babies. Yeah. And there's also no real organized program to teach it. So, that's another right. problem. Oh, that's interesting. I thought they were teaching, I thought they would thought be they teaching would in school. It. Did for that schools, program stop? yeah, they they do have textbooks, but um, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't really say it's really a good program because I had one of the textbooks before and it, it was just utterly boring. Ah, uh, yeah, it, it's completely irrelevant to everyday life. So, so it's not help. Yeah, a student yeah. is not gonna like mm. studying Jeju dialect because yeah. looking yeah. at the textbook, this is just boring. Yeah, I I did learn f French in Canada for eight years, yeah. and I do not speak a lick of French. Right, like it's. Yeah. It's, you know, like it's really difficult to learn in that kind of setting if you're not mm -hmm. practicing. Wanting to. Yeah, yeah. Wanting we're practicing. And practicing it, yeah. The yeah. desire is not there. Yeah. yeah. So now we have the pleasure of you having, being on our show and with the space and time to speak to you, Tommy. Let's, 
Um, Pick his brain? Yeah, yeah. I love it. Tommy's like just a festive you know, yeah. information. Well, well, let's start off with the last time we had you on, or um, the first time we had you on, too. We talked about uh, Hawaii of East Asia. That was the last thing that we looked at is... Mm-hmm. The term Hawaii of Korea came from 1967 policy direction for the island as, of Jeju as the Hawaii of East Asia. Where are we now? Where, what have you discovered, seen? Well, I found that I've, I've had to revise my position even further okay. because I, I found even further back that there actually was a reference to Jeju as the Hawaii of Korea, Hawaii of East Asia in 1955. Really? And this, uh, it was in an American mainland newspaper that mentions a, a U.S. soldier stationed here saying that this is a veritable Hawaii of Korea or the potential to become one. Uh-huh. And it was, actually, it was actually kind of kind of a funny article because, okay. it, because there was nothing was in Jeju. Do you know? Huh? Um, the St. Louis Dispatch. That's what? interesting. Yeah. Yeah, no, the St. Louis Dispatch had quite a bit. Oh, do they? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, Missouri, right? Yeah. St. Louis? Yeah. yeah. yeah yeah, there was a couple uh, soldiers that were on Jeju during Sasam who were from, uh, like, you know, I, I have to check this, so I will get... Quote cool. you on that? Yeah, yeah no, I, there was um, a donation drive that came from Missouri over, like, tons and tons of clothing were brought to Jeju. Didn't we talk to Brenda about that? Didn't we have, yeah. Yeah, so because the orphanage yeah, here, the right? Orphanage. And, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I've, I came across... It, doing some research about this one specific dude, American soldier that was on Jeju who was uh, studying Sasam. He was the one that investigated the March 1st shooting incident. Mm -hmm. And he was the one who arranged for all these tons of... uh, Yeah, to Jeju for the elephant. Like, 6,000 tons of clothing. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. So, uh, continue. So, in this dispatch, 1955, one year after the massacre ended, they officially ended. They had this. Dispatch. Yeah, there, well, there's. It was a kind of a random quote of a soldier that was um, part of the relief efforts um, in, in Jeju that he that he mentioned that um, that Jeju had the potential to be a veritable Hawaii of East Asia, uh-huh. and um, it wasn't really discussed very much in policy. But but there were um, there were some early attempts on the part of the government to to maybe dabble with tourism, uh, but things really did not. Um, go full speed full speed ahead until 1967 when that actually did become policy mm-hmm. so there were there was discussions about making Jeju a tourist location at that time and what, what I found interesting that Hawaii was also doing this at the same time as well because they were just becoming a unite a state of the United States so right after 1959 when they officially became a state they went full speed ahead in making themselves the next big tourism de- destination. So what's interesting is that Jeju's history and Hawaii's history parallel each other. Mm. That's really interesting. Because like the Hawaiian shirts, everyone thinks, of them as, well, that's a marketing campaign. That was literally just for tourism purposes. So when did Jeju really push to become a tourism destination then? From the 1960s. Mm. Because um, there are only discussions in the, 19, in the early 1960s. But once um, President Park Chung-hee takes over, uh-huh. by the middle of the 1960s, um, there's a much more active effort to actually make that happen. So they're no longer just discussing about the potentials or dreaming about what Jeju could be, but they actually are considering making Jeju a tourism destination. Mm. And part of the reason was because of the success of Hawaii. Hawaii became an, a major success beyond anyone's wildest dreams. Right. Oh. Mimic that and yeah. 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 Okay. So, so they, they, they have used Hawaii as a, like a model. Yeah, interestingly, they don't say it directly in the actual planning documents, but certainly in the speeches given by the, gov- gov- the governors of, of, the, of the time in Jeju that they were really much paying attention to what's happening in Hawaii. Fascinating. Yeah. It really, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting to see. But the Missouri, St. whatever, the, the, the dispatch, how that was just more like a flippant, no, maybe not a flippant comment, but he's just speaking about, what was the article about? Uh, the article, it was, it basically portrays Jeju as this, um, this exotic, basically this exotic island off in the middle of nowhere. The article was about Jeju. It, it was just about a Jeju. It was, okay. it was a very general article about Jeju, and okay. it, it mentioned uh, the the um, the sea women, the women divers, of course. Okay. Okay. Um, je, the um, which the soldiers were fascinated with. Yeah, fascinated the, con- the concept with. of of uh, Samda and Sam and Samu also. Mm. Yeah. 
Do you have that article? Yes, somewhere? I do. I have, a, I have a PDF of that article. You do? Yes. Can you share that? I would yeah, love sure. to read that. Okay. <laughs> Can you just give us your hard yeah. research? Just, that all your, yeah, I, just, I would love to read that. That's fascinating. Yeah, no, there's a couple. Like, when you start looking through the archives and stuff, Jeju pops up in weird places, yeah. and it's often about the Henyo and some, like, American newspapers. Yeah, that very sexualized. often about the Henyo. Yeah. yeah, and it was very sexualized. I mean, yeah. the soldiers really, yeah. I mean, the postcards and stuff. Uh, yeah, it was I, I mean, we're still with that now, right? People, like, you see the Henyo, and they're always so romanticized mm -hmm. and, and these ki yeah, kind of yeah. things. So that, but you also have done more research recently connected with Hawaii. Um, can you tell us about the interview that you recently did? Uh, recently, I met the very person who initiated the sister relationship w between Hawaii and Jeju. And the surprise was it was the state of Hawaii that initiated the relationship, oh. actually not Jeju. Really? Why, why, why did Hawaii want to do that? Um, There's actually certain people within the, the government of Hawaii. So there were actually Korean Americans uh, in, the, in the government of, of the state of Hawaii. Uh -huh. uh, Hawaii is quite unusual because they have a much higher Asian population. So the first, um, the first actual elected representatives of, of, of Asian descent happened to be the, the representatives of Hawaii, mm. um, including uh, the governor, Ariyoshi himself. He was the first Japanese American governor of the United States. Uh -huh. And um, he was governor of Hawaii for about 12 years, and one of the lo it was one of the longest reigning governors. And um, when he became governor, his um, focus was to orient Hawaii towards Asia, because uh, there was a sense that Asia was going to be the next big thing in the, t the late 20th century. So Hawaii's tourism orientation was already shifted towards Asia from, from as early as uh, this, the late 60s and, er and early 70s. Mm -hmm. Um, but um, the, the initiative to start the sister relationship between Jeju and, or Hawaii and Jeju was on the part of Korean Americans in, in Hawaii. So Hawaii does have um, some of the earliest immigrants uh, from Korea in, okay. into the United States. So, so several generations down the line, uh, they've become fully American, but they still do think about connecting with their home country in one way, shape, or another. Hmm. So, um, so once, um, once, once uh, the Ariyoshi... Um, administration is pretty much set in Hawaii, there's uh, these initial contacts between, um, between members of the Hawaiian government and also the Jeju government. Why, well, so what's, what is the benefit of being a sister city other than just, is it just publicity? In part it is publicity because, um, well, there, there's, always, there's always a question of just how effective these things really are and sometimes right. they don't really go very far. Right, right. Mm. And indeed, even, even in the, the newspapers within Hawaii during this, uh, these decades, uh, there was a lot of questions on the part of Hawaiians themselves of why do we keep making sister relationships with anyone that has nothing to do with us? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, the, part of the reason they did that was Hawaii was trying to market itself as a, as a tourism destination, as they were becoming the success story for tourism. Oh. So they were looking for as many partners as possible. That they could s spread their name, basically, yeah. and make sure. Oh. And That's what was cool. his, and so it was his initiative to do this, and th what did he say that he wanted to do it for? Just because he was from Korea and he wanted to establish a... I haven't gone that far in the interviewing yet because okay. we've only been exchanging emails back and forth gotcha. on, on getting information. Uh -huh. So that's the next step of, of, of what the process was. Right. But as right. he said in our previous uh, communication, that um, Jeju and Hawaii's sister relationship is, is unusual because, um, because it basically had a life of its own. Sister relationships, they often don't go beyond just like cutting the ribbons on each right, other's buildings. Right, 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 right. Exactly. And then but, the, when, the annual yeah. party or something like, oh, don't yeah. forget we're sister cities. Yeah. yeah, but in this case, they actually do have um, delegations go to each other's events. No they actually have conferences. They actually exchange ideas on, on tourism. Still. Still, Okay. Yes. Oh, really? That's really interesting. Yeah. You would think. Well, okay. <laughs> I'm well, like, you would think there would be some wiseness being passed, you know, from Hawaii, but, uh, you know, like yeah. some words of wisdom to Jeju. Uh, you'd also think that there may be competition for one another, especially since Jeju seems yeah. like the poor man's Hawaii sometimes, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so what are some of the benefits that J they have gotten from this relationship, do you know? For Hawaii? For either or. I don't really know if Hawaii got much out of it, honestly. <laughs> Certainly, Jeju got quite a bit out of it because uh -huh. they exchanged a lot of information. Yes, uh, yes. And, and there were all these academic conferences on tourism policy and development. Right, mm. right. That's fascinating. It is fascinating yeah. and, and to realize. Well, anyways, I'm, I have such a negative view about this, but I'm like, yeah, okay. So, what do you hope this this research, this interview, what are you hoping to it to become? 
Well, I'm more interested in, in um, how the Korean American community got involved. So that's like the missing piece of the puzzle. Okay. Mm-hmm. Because um, cause I, wasn't, I wasn't aware that they were the ones who initiated the process of making Hawaii and Jeju a sister relationship. Mm-hmm. And, and it didn't come from Jeju's side. It's really interesting. I can't. I, I just that. assumed that Jeju would have been the one to sort yeah. of like reach yeah. out. He's not. Is he? He's not still in that role, is he? No. No. Okay. No. Just. Just. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating because, like, I, I mean, it raises questions about so Korean Americans sort of embrace Korea. Does Korea embrace Korean Americans in the same way? Do they? Do they have like? Korea Americans want to have a connection oh, to, their to, to their home, right? Yes. But do, does Korea sort of embrace them as the way that uh, they embrace Korea? Or is that a weird question? My hunch would be no. Yes and no. Uh-huh. But it, well, it really, for um, Koreans, Korean relationships with uh, its diaspora politics, or po- population, it depends on which part of the world you're living in. Right. Mm-hmm. Certainly Korean Canadians and Korean Americans and Korean Australians are, are embraced by Korea. Um, if you're a Korean Chinese, that could be a little tricky. Korean or, Cubans. Or, or Korean Japanese also. Yeah, yeah. that's what I was, yeah. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. So what else are you working on? You have a, an interesting interview tomorrow that um, you told me about. Can you talk about a little bit about for the podcast? Um, not exactly tomorrow. It's oh, actually Saturday. Saturday. Next yeah. weekend. Next, yeah, next weekend. So, yeah, um, uh, I've also been interested in, in the, the queer community in, in Jeju because, um, again, Jeju has its own queer culture festival, and I didn't really expect Jeju to be the place to have one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, so I'm meeting with the organizers of that festival. Good. So, I'm so glad that worked out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So my side project right now is I'm looking at, um, at queer culture and queer, and queer spaces outside of the usual places in Itaewon and Seoul because mm-hmm. much of the attention is focused there. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. My, what I'm interested in is how is it different outside of, the, outside of Itaewon? How, how do in people... In the smaller, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, how do people create their own communities where the community or the, the environment around it is, is probably much more hostile than it is in Very much, yeah. We, um, I often, because I, you know, change you on social on the head, I will often get uh, mm-hmm. e- messages like, can you tell me, is there... Uh, is there queer bars around and yeah. you know where where can I go to meet other queer people and I'm like yeah sorry no there I mean there used to be here in Tapdong there used to be there uh, isn't? I thought there no were... I don't did you no no I think it closed quite some time ago mm. I I remember back when I was working for the paper the Jeju Weekly I tried to write I wanted to write about the the gay community queer community on Jeju mm-hmm. it was like it was very very Difficult. Oh, I never got to because I, mm-hmm. um, not speaking off the record would have been fine, but I couldn't actually get people who wanted to speak off the record. Trying to find locations, people were very close, close uh, mouth about it, which I fully understand. And Especially because JG is such a country, uh, you know, like such a it's small, s- knit small community, knit right? Community, and yeah. so it was. It's really, really, but it's not the same now. Like we do have a queer culture festival on JJ. We didn't have that before. Amazing, because I was involved with that the very first year, and it's amazing that they were able to do that. Uh, The hostility was unbelievable. Uh, The protesters came down from Seoul. Not you know, like all the churches were just lining. Uh, the streets. What uh, the last one because of COVID? Last one was two years ago, mm-hmm. and you know we you you marched from one area to the other area through city hall, and the church and the protesters were just lining. One threw himself under uh, the bus mm-hmm. un, under like I this. I was I brought my daughter that was the uh, first time mm-hmm. she went to the queer festival, and it's amazing uh, what they were able to to yeah. pull off in that. In I mean, anyways, in all environment, it's not you know. Yeah, it, but the it, protesters but were more than more, the people. Than, the protesters were more than and, people. So for them to be able to do that and keep it running and then you know yeah yeah so what do you i think you may find from this research looking into uh queer spaces that are not in itaewon what do you uh, any idea what you may discover or what you have found already well i've been looking also at the city of dejan which is also a, it's a huge city but it's also really not like seoul at all uh-huh. it's um it's kind of country in a certain way and is a bit conservative uh-huh. because, well this whole, this whole point of being was that historically it was it was a colonial railroad town and that was, and still it's not really much there mm. it, it's just a big city that's it uh-huh. yeah uh-huh. um but what i found so far is that there's um there's not really a settled kind of community like people 
don't have actual gay bars to go to in, in mm -hmm. that area. Or they might exist, but only people who already know that they exist are there. Yeah. So it's, it's much more clandestine. So basically, um, the, way, the way it operates is that basically people go to, to queer-friendly spaces and they just temporarily make that their, their queer-friendly space. Mm -hmm. Whereas in ET1 and Seoul, everybody There's knows. There's designated, just, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. HBC, yeah. yeah. They're transient places that based on like just we're queer, we're here, this is now queer space for now, and then, yeah. 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 Oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah, so that seems okay. to be the case in, in Daejeon. Mm -hmm. And and also, it also might be the case for Jeju as well. I might, might imagine that's also the issue, that that, um, that because it's such a tight-knit community, it's, it's kind of hush-hush about where these places exactly are. You know, I this that might be true, but um, I'm pretty welcomed or friendly with enough people and I have yet to hear yeah. like you know there's this place to go to yeah. this place so it's and I, and I did used to go to one here in town so yeah. I knew when there used to be but yeah yeah but I don't know it's it's an interesting subject I wonder if something that you may find is that people just leave there where they are like queer people on Jeju may just leave and go to Seoul because there are more permanent places. And also, you can kind of like... To date and everything. I yeah. Mean, many of my gay friends, uh, are, you know, would have secret boyfriends, secret girlfriends, you know, and then, but for the most part, would go to Seoul to just meet and to be, you know, active. Yeah. Yeah. To, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, I wonder... Still now, it's I, I feel like I have plenty of friends that have secret partners here on Jeju that they're not out they're not mm -hmm. they will never be out yeah uh, of Koreans yeah of Koreans mm -hmm. yeah they will never yeah because it's different if they're you know to be a foreign. Well, Jeju is unusual that it actually does have a queer culture festival mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, well even Daegu of all places mm -hmm. oh, yeah. so but Daegu actually does not oh. oh even though it's a big city they actually don't have queer well, that's culture really festival. interesting because it Okay. How many queer culture festivals are there in, in Korea? There's several, yeah, there's and mostly in the major cities. Okay. Yeah. Daejeon's mm -hmm. kind of the anomaly that they don't have one. Oh, that's that's, interesting. that's yeah. really interesting work. You know, and um, that you have like a year to work on that. So we'll we should have you come back on when you're done to talk about what you've discovered about Jeju's. I mean, if you still want to come back on again after this, <laughs> but like, well, certainly I'm, I'm here every year. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So what else are you hoping to do? Like you're here. You're going to get some, like, sun and relaxation, throw back a couple margaritas? What are you doing? <laughs> um, I don't know about sun because it's been pretty cloudy lately. <laughs> it has been. And it's, it's going to be the yeah. start of the rainy season. Yeah, it's about too. to, yeah. 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 Well, your wife is coming, so a little yes. Yes. honeymoon. Yeah, a little. Just relax and... Yeah, just like an unofficial honeymoon. Yeah. We, well, we're going to do the real honeymoon maybe next year after the actual ceremony. Right, yeah. right. We had right. to delay it twice because yeah. of the pandemic. Yeah. So it's so crazy, isn't yeah. it? My, yeah, yeah. So what, not, I mean, you just got here, but have you noticed any differences from the last time you were here? Oh, a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really? Yeah, well, just walking through the old town, I've seen so many businesses I don't recognize. Uh -huh. and, mm -hmm. and all these buildings that weren't there before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, have you seen the new, what is it, Lotte Tower? The huge... Dream. Dream, 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 dream Tower, tower yeah. I, I could see it from the airplane. <laughs> and you that's see bad. It everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's yeah. funny. Yeah. yeah, it's it's well it's kinda of funny that they they had two towers because it's just like the two towers from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> like you can just somehow see those two towers everywhere. Mordor. Oh, the reason why I mentioned Lotte is because I, I see that one when I come into town, right? From yeah. from and it's just something about it seems so much heavier and big like I don't even it's it's, it's just a, sizable building yeah. and it, it's a it's a hefty building the way they did it i don't yeah. know why it does but it just well, seems so much heavier than all the other metallic buildings. and yeah. you know it just has that appear yeah i just wonder if jj is ever going to sink from all the development that we're putting on top of it yeah no. anyways yeah well, <laughs> let's uh let's, let's let's take a commercial break and then we'll come back with a jj5 yeah and then we'll eat because i am I'm starving. starving so let's Same do it quickly <laughs> So now that you've been an official like interviewee on our show, we're going to ask you the Jeju 5, which is five rapid-fire questions about Jeju, um, and you have to be completely truthful, or uh, you, you don't get to come on the podcast again. <laughs> completely wow. truthful. Jeez, no pressure at all. So first right. question, where on the island do you go to get away? Where on the island do I go to get away? 
usually you actually go to a tea shop. A, tea, a, a specific tea shop or just a random tea shop? Well, there's, a, there's actually one that I usually go to, um, assuming that it's open because their hours are sometimes weird. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's this place called Chai, Chai Hyanggi in, on uh, Chilsung Road. Oh. So that's like my go-to That's your place. haven, huh? Yeah. Okay, next question. What is your go-to beverage at the mart? Soju, makgeolli, mechju, or, or anything else, anything but... Else. Um, I don't drink alcohol at all. That's so, right. That's yeah, right. what I usually drink is gampio juice. Okay, okay. The coast, hala or orum? Hala. Why? Well, funny thing is I've only been there twice. Uh -huh. And I actually haven't been all the way to the top. Okay. So I really have to get, get to the top someday. <laughs> <laughs> eh. All right. What's something you know about Jeju that most others don't, which you know so much? So what do you think you know more than the average person? What do I know more about Jeju than Like a fact. A fact? Yeah. Something that would surprise most people. Hmm. Something that would surprise most people. There's going to be a lot that I was just going to say, I would imagine this is a hard question yeah. for you because you have so many factoids in your head. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. No, Jeju, like Jeju's um, dialect is actually classified as as a different language in the Korean language family. So it's actually not just a dialect. Yeah. Okay. That is an interesting fact. Right? All right. And, oh, do, is that mine? Uh, what would you change about Jeju if you could change something about Jeju? Hmm, there's a little too much to change. <laughs> well, certainly the tourism numbers. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. But so if we want to reduce tourism, what would we do to compensate for the economy, right? Like that's the thing that we need to worry about. Businesses yeah. here, you know, like support. Tech businesses is yeah, what I would want to lean yeah. towards. Yeah. Yeah, also, and also just um, just improve the quality of tourism. So like, like maybe it might cost a little more, but at least make it worthwhile. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, th thank Tom, you so thank much. You so as so always, much for being we really on. appreciate it's it. Great. Thank you. Yeah. It's Let's, a pleasure. Oh. No. Can we eat? Yes. yes. Let's go eat. Aslam, <laughs> little plug for them. Make sure you guys come yeah, here and support sure. this business. Yeah, definitely come here. What what's your go to dish? What's your favorite dish? Oh, I everything here is why, but for sure, for sure the hummus with the beef on top of it. Yeah. Then the eggplant tip. Yeah. I mean I, the whole menu. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. Okay. Ciao. Now that's been another episode of Me You and Jeju. Before we sign off, I'd like to thank Tommy again for coming on. It's always a pleasure having him on our show, and uh, this episode, uh, this interview, is, is no exception to that rule. So uh, thank you so much for coming on, and we look to have you on again uh, in the near future. And, of course, to all of you who have listened, who have listened this far, thank you. Uh, now, the music for our show is brought to you by Jason Lisko. Arts by Sarah Hodgkiss, co-host Alexis Joy, and I am Daryl Coote. Speak to you next time. Bye. <laughs>